Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Excited about the broadcast today. <clears throat> this webinar came about because I can't tell you how many times I hear from users, uh, even AccuGraph users who've been using the program for a long time, who say, wait a minute, I just found out that I could do this with it or that it would do that. I didn't know that. How long has it done that? And in some cases, I, I have to tell people, uh, golly, it's done that since 2010. Or a lot of the features are brand new things that we put in in AccuGraph 5. The point is, we want you to get the best value from your AccuGraph investment. We work really hard in putting in the best features, and they all come from you. We take the feedback that our users give us. We kind of have a wish list that we always keep updated. And as we add features, we want to make sure you're aware of them and that you can use them to make your life easier and better. So that said, let's get into it. I'm going to go over eight features in AccuGraph that you may not be aware of that you should be. And I'm kind of flying solo today. Uh, Kimberly is actually in the other room. Uh, she's not allowed to walk in here because she's still getting over this flu thing that she's had, and I just assume that stay over there. So uh, Kimberly is here in spirit, and she is watching. And if she just can't resist, uh, I don't know if she's going to pop her head in and yell things at me. But uh, we're going we're gonna to see if I can handle flying solo today. And uh, let's all send good wishes and good healing energy to Kimberly, who looks like she's beaten this thing, but still needs to get strong. All right, with that said, let's jump into our presentation today. Now, first of all, beginning exam, lab, lung nine. You should all be familiar with this screen right here, the AccuGraph exam screen. And we're all aware that there are different kinds of exams in AccuGraph. I get asked that a lot. People often, tell you, or often ask me, um, hey, you know, when should I use which exam? When do I use source? When do I use a Jingwell exam? Uh, what's this Ryota Raku thing? And so let's just go over that. Uh, let's start with the source point exam. This is, of course, the one that you're most familiar with, probably. And I would imagine that most of you uh, use this as your primary exam, although not all of you, I'm sure. The source points or the Yuan points, these are going to give you the best reflection of the main channel and also of the organ that it's associated with. Uh, this is a great exam to do because it's very sensitive. It shows a lot of variability. So you'll, you'll have findings on this exam most commonly. Now the downside with the source point exam is point location. You know, of course, we do our best with, uh, with the pictures and the illustrations, but in the end, it comes down to making sure that you get the points right. And hopefully, you're aware that you can take the probe during an exam and you can move it around. Let me just do a quick demo here. So right now, it's asking me for my lung nine. Um, my in frame here pretty good? All right, here we go. So... Lab, pericardium seven. Now you can see as I was moving around, you, or maybe you could hear the tone changed. And then if you look at the screen, you can see that I moved onto the point and then I moved off of the point. And so we have this little chart that shows over here on the right side of AccuGraph that shows the reading in real time. So as you move around, you can see whether you're on the point or not. So pro tip is make sure that you're on the point. And if you're not, it's okay to move around a little bit and get the highest reading you can, and look for a plateau. Oftentimes it'll, it'll rise and then it'll hit a plateau. The plateau is what you're looking for. So with Jingwell then, um, it's, it's a great exam. It's my go-to, I use it most often. Uh, excuse me, not Jingwell, source. With Jingwell, we'll switch over here and let Beginning it, exam. there we go. Lab, lung 11. The Jingwell points, as you probably remember, are the points where the main channel and the musculotendinal branch of the channel intersect. And so those points are going to give you not only a reflection of the main channels, but they're also going to reflect the musculotendinos, um, perhaps the, the, the more shallow um, chi, and they're also going to reflect the, the role of the musculotendinos as kind of a reservoir. So when you have overflow, excess that can flow into the musculotendinos or you can draw from. 
this is not going to be as sensitive of an exam, meaning you're not going to have as many findings or as many highs and lows normally. And these points are generally less conductive, and so they'll tend to read lower across the board. However, if you're dealing with a musculoskeletal problem, um, or if you're not getting findings on the source point exam, then go to the Jingwell. Sometimes people say, well, I did a source point exam and it was all green. Now what do I do? And I said, well, what does a Jingwell look like? And sure enough, they'll say, oh, wow, yeah, that's where the imbalance is. They were in the musculotendinal branches. So that gives some great direction, another way to examine the patient, more to look at. Okay, the Ryota Raku exam. Beginning exam, lab, hand one. A lot of people aren't familiar with this exam. And so first you need to know just a little bit of history. Notice that it says hand one, hand two, etc. as you go through the exam. And then when we get over to the feet, lab, foot one. It says foot one, foot two. All of that goes back to the original Raku. Back in the day when, when Dr. Nakatani first developed Rotoraku, uh, being that they recognized that these, the, these meridians, these lines that he was finding electrically, they of course matched the traditional Chinese meridians. But I, I guess there's kind of a penchant that when you discover things, you want to name it yourself. And so rather than using the names of the Chinese points, he named them hand one, hand two, hand three, and so on, and then foot one, foot two, foot three. And so that, that's what they're called. Even today in Japan, in Ryotoraku, that's how they practice. They call them hand and foot points. But we know that they all correlate with the traditional Chinese points. And so to follow the Ryotoraku protocol, we still put them in there, calling them hand one and hand two, but then we put in parentheses what they are. Now, one other thing to show you. When you look at these, most of them are going to be the traditional Yuan source Lab, points, but not all of them. So we have lung nine, Lab, pericardium Lab, seven, heart three. seven, and so on. Lab, and four. But then we go to small intestine five instead of small intestine four, because that was the point that Nakatani initially used. In the end, nine of the 12 are actually Yuan source points. The other three are not. They're the point next to the Yuan source point because that's what Dr. Nakatani came up with way back in the day. And for traditionalists and for those who still practice the purest Japanese style, the Ryotoraku exam is in there. Uh, I will tell you that uh, just a couple quick statistics, you know, kind of peeking under the hood a little bit. Our users, um, Generally, uh, oh, a very high percentage of the exams are Yuan source exams. I don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's 70, 80 percent of the exams that are done out there are Yuan source points. The remainder are the Jingwell points, and then it's, you know, like one percent or less that are Raku exams, which tells me that there aren't a lot of purists out there trying to do it the way it was done 60 years ago in Japan. But if you want to, you can. That's what the Ryotoraku exam is for. Let's talk about now the single point exam. The single point exam is used when you want to measure and then remeasure a point. You want to get a, a baseline on the point and then measure it again to see uh, how that point changes. And so I'm just going to grab my lung nine here and let's take a look at the screen as I take a series of measurements. Okay, so there it went, landed at 124, nice plateau. Now you'll notice it doesn't take nearly as long to plateau, and it's gone up a little bit. And here we go, we've got it more or less uh, now maxed out. It's going to land right there in the 130s every time. Now with that being said, now that I've got the point consistently reading, that means it's electrically saturated. If I wanted to test an effect of something, like if I needled something uh, elsewhere on that channel, or I took an herb pill and put it in my mouth, or uh, tried some other kind of intervention or therapy, and then remeasure the point to see how it changes that meridian in real time. Now I haven't done anything to change the meridian, so it's still reading roughly where it was. But suppose I did something and it went from the 135 range 
and dropped down to the 95 range or, or shot up to 150, I can see in real time what the changes are. Now, I do want to tell you, not many practitioners do that sort of work, and there's a certain amount of finesse to it because with probe technique, you know, if you press harder, if you, if you cheat, you can change results. It's a fact. And I've seen, unfortunately, in the past, I've, I've met people um, using other techniques who do that, who actually, you know, in order to try to sell you something, they'll, they'll manipulate whatever they're measuring. Um, and so my, my recommendation there is you got to just be very honest and consistent and let the results be the results. Some people can do this really well and get great insight, and some people can't make heads or tails of it. So if it's your thing, great, there you go. And if not, let it go. Don't worry about it. The last exam type to talk about then is the screening exam. Beginning exam, left, lung nine. Now on the screening exam, as you can see on the screen here, it only shows the hand points. So lung, pericardium, heart, small interest in small intestine, Sanjiao, large intestine. And you can either use source or you can use Jingwell. The purpose of this is if you're doing a public screening and you don't want people to have to take their shoes off, um, you want to just do something that's quick and easy that you can show people their results and then schedule a full exam. That's the purpose of this. That's why it's called screening. This is something you would go use in public just for screening people. By the way, it's a highly effective way to get new patients. We have people that do it a lot and get tremendous results. By the way, you ever tried this? Focus aid. Really cool. No, nootropic. Helps with brain focus. I figure since I'm winging it alone and don't have Kimberly backing me up, I need all the help I can get, right? All right. Um, before we move on to the next topic, I'm just going to take a quick look here. I see that we have some questions coming in. Uh, Melanie says, just finished acupuncture training, not licensed yet. Want to know how to use the acugraph in our office as soon as I can see patients. Um, well, great. Uh, congratulations, first of all, on finishing your training. That's totally cool. Um, in terms of how to use this in your office, the, the number one piece of advice I'll give you, and there's, you know, there's a lot of nuance, but the number one piece of advice is use it. Um, use it from the very first day, from the very first patient. Your patients will love it. It will make acupuncture explanation a lot easier. It will smooth the interactions you have with your patient so that communication is open. Uh, and then get them used to, from day one, the idea that this is what they can expect from you, that you're going to use technology, that you're going to give them feedback, and that you're going to monitor in real time. The other piece of advice I'll give you is go out and do a screening event. If you're opening your own practice, great way to get patients coming in the door. So go to a health fair, go to a work uh, site where they have work site health evaluations, go to a health food store and set up a table. Um, get creative, find a venue where people are interested and they will line up and they will actually wait in line to get a free screening from you. And it gives you uninterrupted time to talk to them about their health, to talk to them about acupuncture, and to schedule a visit. So, good question, Melanie. Thanks. Um, let's see, Adam says, when did you actually start? I missed some because I wasn't on it first. It's going to be replay. Uh, yeah, I think you'll be able to replay it. Um, <laughs> Adam says, I played often with the Ryodoraku exam some time ago. Uh, it's been a while, though. Yeah, I would imagine so. All right. Well, let's jump into some more features. The exam thing was a little long, but I wanted you to have that because I get asked so often. Let's go into something that is a little more interesting. Now, Lung. Lung nine. I don't mean to brag, but this is my graph. Uh, I just graphed myself, uh, oh, not quite an hour, a little over an hour ago, uh, source point graph, and I was kind of pleased because, hey, look at all that green, right? On the other hand, uh, look at what's going on over here. I've got this gallbladder that is excessive and split. I've got this stomach that's really excessive. And there's actually more findings that we'll get into. But first, an issue I want to talk about is this. Look at gallbladder. And by the way, I want you to know, I have not edited this at all. This is my actual graph. And uh, it's kind of cool because it's going to illustrate some important things. 
So look at gallbladder and tell me, is that a split or is that excess? Because it's way up there, but there is not a, a really good balance between left and right. And so how would you treat that? Now, obviously, you're the practitioner. AccuGraph can only report what it finds, but in the end, it's up to you to decide what you're going to do about it. So let's suppose I look at this gallbladder and I say, you know, yeah, it's split, but the real problem is that both sides are excess. And so really, I want to treat that as excess rather than treating it as split. You can click on any finding and right here in channel status, so this gallbladder channel, instead of split, which is the as measured, I say, no, 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 I want to treat that as excess. So I just change it to high. And when I close that, voila, now it is treated as an excess. The, the recommended point has changed. Now it's recommending gallbladder 38 rather than 37, which is the sedation point of the gallbladder channel. And then I can further customize. If I decide, yeah, well, you know what? I want to treat that sedation point. So I just click on it here and add it to my treatment plan. But I also want to treat that Luo point because of the left-right imbalance. For example, I can do that. Just a click, and they go right into my treatment plan in real time. So it's kind of cool because in the end, you get to make that call about whether it's split or whether it's excess or whatever it may be. Likewise, I want to show you something else that you can do that, that sometimes you may miss. And these are the almosts, okay? So take a look over here. Look at pericardium. Look at heart. In fact, heart is a great example. So let's look closely at heart. One side is measuring 76. The other side, 86. Because it has one leg that made it into the normal range, and the normal range right here is 85 to 113, based on the calculations for me today. And so because one side of it barely made it in, it just barely squeaked by, this gets called normal. But I don't know, what do you think? Is that really normal? Are you satisfied with that? Um, ideally, you would want that to have both legs in. You would want it to be a little bit better balanced. You know, looking, uh, say, for example, like spleen here. 109, 111, both well within the range, very comfortable. So you can click on heart and say, no, no, no. I know it's barely, barely showing green, but we're going to call that deficient and we're gonna add a tonification point, and there we go. So just like that, I customized my treatment. So you get the idea that in the end, it comes down to you. You get to decide what's high, what's low, what's split, and what you're going to do about it. If you don't wanna make those decisions, you can just take what AccuGraph suggests. But I will tell you that we put that in because over the years, we had a lot of very smart practitioners saying, yeah, you know, I find myself having to override recommendations and there's no way to do that. So feel free, uh, override recommendations all you want. Now at the same time, let me show you something else you can do here. I'm gonna go back over here to my gallbladder channel where it's showing this excess. I'm gonna click on the channel again and you can see that it's showing the gallbladder channel. Notice that the channel is red because I tagged it as being excess, so it shows red. And this is great for patient education because you can show where the channel runs, what it's doing, um, and how it may associate with the pain the patient has, okay? But along with that, you also get the musculotendinal pathway showing the, the musculotendinal and cutaneous areas, and you get the internal pathways. So musculotendinal pathway, let's start there. If you were to look at my graph today and you were to see that gallbladder being that excess, what would you guess? I mean, any, any thoughts about uh, what I might be experiencing? Because I'll give you a hint. I've got this shoulder right up here, kind of starting at the base of my neck and going all the way down into the shoulder joint that's been bothering me. And I actually, uh, I went to my continuing education class yesterday and I sat in class for nine hours on one of those really hard little hotel crappy stackable chairs, you know, um, at one of those little tables, and it was really uncomfortable. And I just got more and more sore, so by the end of the day, I just couldn't get any relief. 
So when I came in and graphed myself this morning and saw this, I said, uh, yep, yep, absolutely nailed it. That's where the pain is. And look at that gallbladder channel. Internal pathways, though, this is what Kimberly showed me. And I was, I was really impressed with this because I hadn't even thought about looking at the internals. And as I was preparing for the webinar, Kimberly pulled this up and said, yeah, well, look, the internal channel from gallbladder, it goes heavily through the jaw and it's heavily influenced by what's going on in the jaw. And then if we go over here and look, look at stomach, same thing. The internal pathway of stomach, which is also excess in my graph, heavily influenced by the jaw. And so when I looked at both of those, Kimberly, again, she's really smart. She says, hey, Adrian, you know, haven't you had a bunch of dental work done lately? And I have. <laughs> in fact, um, I had a, an old filling that broke and ended up when they tried to go in and redo the filling, they said, oh, golly, you know, it's, it, there's not enough tooth because of the, what broke and we're going to have to put a crown on. And so they pre prepped for the crown and then that turned into a root canal. It was a mess. Anyway, it's all finished. It's all good. Mouth is great, but the meridians apparently are not. So I'm going to need to do some work on these internal channels and get things balanced again. And I'm betting that that's going to be a real key to getting my shoulder feeling better. And so the internal pathways, great way to help your patients not only understand what's going on, but to get some better insight into what you may be missing and how you can help them get better quicker. So excellent uh, insight there. Thanks, Kimberly. Appreciate that. Next, before we start talking about treatment for me today, I want to do a couple of other features here. Let's jump in and let's do a little bit of documentation. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk through and document this as if I was documenting my own patient. So I'm going to document myself. I'm going to go into the patient file here. Oh, by the way, as you can see in the patient file, I did two graphs today. I did a Jingwell and I did the source. I did the source first. I did the Jingwell second. And when I did these, um, interestingly, Let's take a look here. I will just pop this over here and then I will compare. When we put the comparison up, there's that gallbladder. It's showing in both. It's showing in musculotendino through the jing wells. It's showing in the source points through the internals. Whoops, clicked it there, didn't mean to. We'll just pull up the compare again. And then additionally, you know, I talked about how pericardium and heart were both kind of borderline. Well, look at pericardium in the musculotendinos. It's also showing split and very low on one side. So the correlation between the two graphs is interesting and useful. So if we close that, go back to my notes, then there's a few things that we can do here. First of all, uh, in the notes, hopefully you are all aware that you can do templates. So for example, if you use a soap note format, you can create a soap note template. It's very easy. Once you've created it, you can just click add to note and I can start here and I can take a soap note about whatever the problem happens to be. And so uh, subjective, objective, and so on. I can go OPPQRST if that's how I want to document the chief complaint, or I can use the chief complaint built-in documentation. So I'm going to, no, I'm not going to save that note. I'm going to jump over here to chief complaint and I'm going to say right shoulder pain. And onset, it's actually been bugging me for about two weeks, but it got really bad yesterday. Uh, right shoulder, base of the cervical spine, to shoulder joint. Uh, duration is, um, it comes and goes, sometimes lasts for uh, an hour or two at a time. I can, I can do characteristics, uh, achy and dull, good grief, A-C-H-Y, and so on aggravated, alleviated, I can go on and I can document the entire chief complaint. 
And then I can say, okay, on a scale of, of one to 10, what is it? Oh, it's about a four. It bothers me pretty bad sometimes. And now I save this, and this will be in my chief complaint list. It's already created a note here. If I go to my patient overview, click over here on my overview, then on my chief complaints, I've got right shoulder pain right here. And if I click there, then it will take me back into my chief complaint. So I can follow that through until it's been resolved. Um, if you're not doing that for tracking your chief complaints, you might find it really useful. And you might find it also a really good way to document your notes particularly if your notes ever get reviewed, if an insurance company wants to look at them to decide whether to pay your bill, if you're treating um, a, an auto accident or injury case, something like that, then documenting chief complaints is absolutely critical, not only to protect you, but to protect your patient, so that if there is ever uh, a point where, uh, say, an insurance company questions whether the chief complaint is real, well, there it is, it's documented. Heard about a case yesterday, actually, in my CE training where somebody was in an auto accident and they injured their spine and uh, their knee hit the dashboard. But the practitioner who was, this, in this case, it was a chiropractor only working on the spinal stuff, just documented spinal stuff. Well, six weeks later, when the patient goes to get knee surgery to fix the knee, the insurance company says that didn't come from the car accident. Look, Look in the doctor's notes. The knee was never mentioned after the car accident. Well, had that doctor been documenting the chief complaints properly, the insurance company wouldn't have been able to say that. So there's a little pro tip. Okay, uh, before we talk about other documentations, I see that we have a couple of questions. Adam says, what's your interpretation when a meridian shows as being over energy in one exam and under energy in the other? Cool question, Adam. I appreciate that. So here's the deal. Think about that. If something shows excess when you do the U on source point, so main channel internals shows excess, but then it shows deficient when you do the Jing well, the musculotendinose showing deficient. What does that tell you about the connection between the main channel and the musculotendino branch? Clearly, there's, they're not communicating because otherwise that would be able to balance out a little bit better. And so you might actually treat not measure, but treat the Jingwell point on that channel to open up that connection between the excess in one and the deficiency in the other and see if that'll balance out. Um, that also may mean that you have something that is superficial, not deep, or vice versa. So yeah, take that into consideration. Uh, if you're actually going to look at both types, then it's really useful to do what I did, put them side by side and compare. So great question. Uh, and there was another question, um, what's your interpretation? Uh, oh, no, I did that one. <laughs> Sorry. Aaron says, are there templates others have created that we can share? Um, no, we don't have a way of sharing templates, but in the end, they're just text. And so it's quite easy for you to just create one and type it in. They're usually not particularly complex. And so the amount of time to create a template can be a matter of a couple of minutes. Um, but that's a, that's a good suggestion, you know, sharing templates. Maybe we need to look into see if there's a way that that could be done. So thanks for that. Um, all right. Kimberly says, Adrian, can you go click on the spinal portion of your graph and show the muscles related? Adam Lehman had a question about popliteus muscle. Uh, yeah, we will, uh, we will get to that. Um, I'm going to do that a little bit later in the, uh, in the presentation. Okay, so we talked about documenting chief complaints. Um, next, let's talk about using pictures for documentation. Hopefully, you're all aware that you can take pictures of any body part or problem, whatever it is that you're treating. If the patient has an injury or a rash or a spider bite or swelling or anything that you need a picture of, how about a tongue? No problem. You can either take a picture by using the built-in camera on your computer which there it is right now. I'm using the built-in camera on mine and I can just snap a picture. And, <laughs> ooh, that's a great one. Let's use that. <laughs> and I want to point out in the background, you see Cameron and Kimball sitting at the table out in the common area, right over there. 
And they are the ones who are live mixing this thing and doing the broadcast. So nice going, guys. Thanks. Um, those are my two brothers that work here. Uh, Kimball does all of the software programming. And um, so everything that you see, he built for you. Thank you. And then Cameron makes sure that you can um, actually know about it all and see it. So we'll just add a note. You can add a note to any picture. and save that. But the other thing you can do with pictures, and I didn't point that out, not only use the camera, but you can also just drag and drop. So if you have a picture that you've taken with another camera, or you snapped one with your phone, for example, or perhaps you have something else that's an image that needs to go there. It could be um, something that uh, the patient brought in to show you. Maybe they have um, a bottle of something that they're taking and they want to know your opinion. Snap a picture of the bottle, pop it in there and say the patient's currently taking this. Now you have a record of it. There you go. So use the photograph feature. Uh, take full advantage of that. There's also a location feature where something that's not really photographable but is location specific. Um, this is what I look like with my shirt off, guys. And uh, so right here on my right shoulder, I've got... Uh, some uh, shoulder pain and instability. And so, no, not mental instability. I heard that. Uh, so I can save that, and now I've got location-based. And that's really important when you've got uh, a patient that's describing a certain area of the body, or you've got multiple chief complaints. It'll put different numbers on each location for you, and in the notes, you can number them one at a time. So take full advantage of the documentation features. Now, there's one other one, and this one is less well-known, but I want to point it out. It's right up here next to the tabs. Can you see that where it says Add Attachment? Well, guess what you can do with that? Add an attachment. Any kind of a file. Um, not any kind, but your basic you know, PDF, JPEG. So let's say, for example, that you have lab results that your patient gives you. They email over a PDF and say, hey, you know, I had my blood drawn and these are the results my doctor sent me. What do you think? Well, you've got to put that in the file. I mean, that's part of the medical record. And so you take that PDF, you just click on the add attachment button. You can either drop a file right here, just drag it and drop it and it's attached, or you can browse and go find the file to drop it there. And now it is saved as part of the permanent record and it will show up in your scrolling. So there you go. Um, that's how you can add files and you should be adding any, any external documentation that your patient gives you. And if you decide not to add something, you can just hit the clear button and you're back to where you were. Okay, let's go back to my graph and talk about a couple of other features here. This is the graph we were working on before. And let's see a few more things that we haven't looked at yet. Number one, we often get asked about these other treatment types. So before we get into the other treatment types, I want to talk about custom treatments because you'll see this tab right here with custom treatments on it. But we have a lot of practitioners who aren't actually using custom treatments the way they could. So I want to give a little example here of how to use that. So I'm going to go to my reference section, click on reference, Click on Custom Treatments, and this is where you can program or set up your custom treatments. So I've put in a category here for essential oils. Essential oils are really intriguing to me, and um, I've been playing around with them just a little bit, and I want to start using them with acupuncture treatments. I know there's some folks that do that and get very good results. So I'm going to add an essential oil rule to AccuGraph. So uh, I'm adding a recommendation. I've already got the category. The category is essential oils. I already added that. So I'm going to add a recommendation. And now I can title the recommendation. It's already uh, highlighted here for me to give a title to this recommendation. Well, the one I'm going to recommend is uh, gallbladder. And let's see what I'm going to call it. Um, based on my list, I'm going to call it, I'll just go ahead and click up here. peppermint oil. That's the one I'm going to recommend. And it's going to go in the essential oils category, which I've chosen right here. And I'm going to say, hey, you know what? When you see a gallbladder that is excessive, 
So here I've hit the conditions that will trigger that recommendation. And you can have multiple conditions. For example, I could say, hey, only recommend peppermint oil when gallbladder and stomach are both excessive. And it will only recommend it when it fulfills that. And you can be as complex as you want. You can say, you know, if gallbladder is high or split, then I want to uh, use peppermint oil. In this case, I'm going to make, keep it simple. I'm going to say, no, 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 gallbladder excess, then I want to see this recommendation. Got some text here I'm going to paste in. A friend of mine who is an oil guru gave me some great info about how the oils affect meridians, and so I'm going to paste that in. Look at this. Peppermint can relieve irritability, mood swings, frustration, and emotional behavior. Hey, that's me, right? As well as being helpful in treating colds and flu. Well, who doesn't want that? Additionally, it's helpful for overcoming digestive stagnation and for treating the gallbladder. Cool. That's why I put it in as a gallbladder recommendation. So I just click Save, and now you see that it's over here in my list. But now, if I go back to my graph, let's go to this one, the source point graph that I've been working with. If I go back to my graph and I look at Custom, well, under the Essential Oils category for this graph today, if I click it, it's saying, here's your custom recommendation. And from now on, because I've programmed it in there, anytime I have a patient with gallbladder excess, it's going to offer me the peppermint oil as a recommendation. I don't have to use it, but it offers it to me. And I've got all that text there to remind me why I might want to recommend peppermint oil. Make sense? Now, you can do this not only with oils. You can do it with exercise. You can do it with nutrition. You can do it with other herbs that aren't already in the AccuGraph Herbal Library. You can do it with other nutritional lines. Um, whatever it is that you want to take a few minutes to put in, you know, for excess of this, use that. And for deficient this, do that. You just put them in there, and they're in there forever. And so you can have a complete custom treatment library at your fingertips. You can have multiple customs that'll come up for each graph, and you choose the ones you want. Once you've chosen them, then they go into the patient file, that that goes in as a recommendation, uh, it's in the documentation, it's already all pre-built for you. So, if you do anything out of the ordinary, go ahead and memorialize it in AccuGraph so that you can do it permanently. All right, with that said, I'm going to go back here to the graph, and we're taking a look now at the Points tab. And this is where we have all the different graph types. That's a webinar for a different day. We've got all the treatment types. We're building my treatment plan with points. And I'm going to, you see this little house right here? I'm gonna click that for each of my recommendations. And I'm gonna say I want those for home treatment. In fact, we'll take out gallbladder 37. So here's my recommended points, and I recommended them for home as well. That's gonna be important when we get over here to the home care tab. So let's do a quick review of these other tabs. First, in the herbs, if you're, if you're uh, looking at herbs, then it's going to give you a recommendation and it's going to give you a score. The higher score means that herb is more highly recommended. And so, in this case, I've got four recommendations. I can click on each one. I can read about the indications, the contraindications, and so on, and decide if one of those is good for me. Um, if it is, then I can prescribe that. Uh, and if I prescribe it, then I just click up here, prescribed one bottle, and that puts it in the notes for the day. Now, I, I have no idea whether this is a formula that I'd want to take, but I just put it in there so I have something to demonstrate with right now. Ultimately, the decision's up to you as the practitioner. Likewise with food. If I come over here, I've got that excess gallbladder, and... Um, I'm just going to uh, take a look here. Say that I've got uh, chi stagnation going on. Uh, frustration, distension of the abdomen or throat, wandering, distending pains, depression, irritability, frequent sighing. Uh, okay, let's go with that. Let's say I've got chi stagnation there. It gives me the dietary recommendations right here. Vegetables, beverages, fruits, and so on, along with a healthy TCM-based diet. And if I decide it's not chi stagnation, if I decide instead that it's uh, damp cold, then it's going to give me a, a different set of 
recommendations. In this case, because I've got both of them highlighted, damp, cold, and cheese stagnation, now it has added cumulatively, it adds to the, to the list. And if I take off cheese stagnation, then it goes back to just the damp, cold recommendations. So you can do that. You can be as specific as you want. You can have multiple uh, meridians in here. So I could also go to stomach meridian, let's say, and suppose I've got excess heat in the stomach and there we go. Now I've got a much larger list getting built. And you'll see some of them are underlined green. Those are items that appear on both recommendations. So good for the gallbladder, good for the stomach. These are your two for the price of one types of things. So it's saying pearl barley and regular barley. I wonder if liquid barley counts. Uh, anyway, so there we go. That, that's what you can do with, uh, with the dietary recommendations. And to, uh, well, I'll just leave those in there for, for demonstration purposes. Custom, we already talked about. I've got my custom recommendation in here. When I go to spinal, this is interesting because the results from the current exam are saying that associated muscles, subscapularis, subscapularis is going to be responsible for the shoulder stability. And because I'm in, I've been feeling some instability in this shoulder, and I've got subscapularis coming up, anterior deltoid from the gallbladder, and then stomach, uh, biceps, the, the SCM, the pec major, clavicular division, and neck flexors and extensors. I've got some neck stuff, but it's also interesting it picked up the popliteus muscle because <laughs> I've been having pain in the posterior side of, guess where, my knee. But it's the opposite side as my shoulder. Posterior left knee, anterior right shoulder. Interesting that AccuGraph picked all that up off of one exam. Um, let's see. There was a question. Oh, Adam Lehman says, had a question about the popliteus muscle. Uh, doesn't look like I'm able to pull up whatever that question was. If anybody can, uh, any of my staff wants to shoot that over to me, then that'd be great. Oh, and Jenny noted that there are templates that Kimberly created uh, with the webinar called Notes 101. And we'll talk about how to go get those in a minute. Cool. All right, anyway, moving along then, we talked about all of the different care types, points, herbs, food, customized recommendations, uh, the spinal protocols. And now let's talk about home care and how to use that. Okay, so here we are. I clicked on the home care tab. I've got the herbal prescription in there that I clicked on earlier under herbs. I've got the diet in there that I clicked on under food. I've got the custom recommendation in here. That was the peppermint oil. And if I, there are home care instructions that I want to put in here, then that's totally cool. I can add those in. I can say, patient needs to sleep in every morning doctor's orders. There we go. Okay, I gave myself some great home care instructions. Um, oh, Shari, I, I got the uh, question here. Have you considered adding the kinesiology-related muscles? A silver gallbladder could have popliteus in there as a possibility. That was a question, and uh, there we go. Um, thank you for, for uh, pointing that out. And yeah, that, that came up, so um, good catch. Uh, appreciate that, Adam. Um, he's sharp on the kinesiology, guys. Okay, so back to home care. This is what we've done. I've got my herbs. I've got my diet. I've got my custom. I've got my home care instructions. I've got my home care points that I chose over here by clicking on points, clicking on under the little house icon. And so when I look at my summary, oh, let's go back so I can save. Save that. All right, there we go. Now when I look at my summary, I've got, and I'm here in this is where I, this is the printing window, this is where you put together the report. And so I've got in here my baseline graph, my, my energy cycle, I can choose which graphs I want in here. I can choose what other information, and I want the dietary, I want the custom, I want the home care instructions, 
and I'll put in the herbal. And now that I've got that, I can scroll through and let's see the, the report that I just built. So I've got my graphs, I've got my meridian information here. Coming up next, this is my dietary recommendations and my grocery list right here. Custom treatment, it tells me about the peppermint oil. Home care instructions, I've got my little prescription that I get to sleep in. And self-treatment points, I've even included the points for myself to treat myself at home. Now, all of that is built into AccuGraph. There's nothing you have to do except remember to check the boxes. So the home care stuff can be really powerful. Remember, it's all right here, but everything that's fed into home care except the home care instructions, everything that's fed into home care comes from someplace else. The herbs, the diet, anything custom you do, the points, they all come from other places and they're consolidated here in home care so that when I go to my report, I have a real comprehensive report for what the patient can do for themselves at home. So that's how to use home care recommendations. Now, of course, if I print or email this report, it goes straight to the patient. They've got it. They're ready to go and they can get involved in their care, which patients love to do. Okay, let's take a couple more of these questions before we jump over to the last couple features I want to talk about. Uh, question from Lelia, I think. Hope I'm saying your name right. Can you tell us more about how to use the spinal and what it means? Do you have a prior class on that? By the way, it says she is coming to the symposium. Good call on coming to the symposium. Um, looking forward to seeing you there. Going back to spinal, yeah, there's a couple more things I can tell you about that. First, if you do any body work, um, or if you work with a practitioner that does body work, maybe tweena, massage, chiropractic, um, any associated practice like that, this is going to show you areas of the spine that may be involved and that muscle, muscles that you may want to focus on. So the more red it is, in this case, uh, T4 and T5, as well as T8 through T10, for me, are probably areas that I ought to at least look at. Now, it's not going to diagnose and say, oh, there's a spinal problem at this spot. It's not going to say, oh, there's a subluxation at this spot. What it is going to do is say, hey, you should go look here, at least examine. And so, whether you do the body work yourself whether you correlate with someone else, even if you just have rapid release and you wanna just go make sure that those areas are released and flowing smoothly, that's what you can do with the spinal exam. <clears throat> really a useful and helpful thing to do because how important is the spine to the overall flow of chi in the body? What about those back shoe points that are associated with all the other meridians? There's a lot going on in the back <clears throat> because that's where the cord is, central nervous system is, integration for the whole body. That's why we have the spinal there. So that's a little bit more about what you can do with it. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, oh, yep, same question twice, thank you. I, I've got two staff people feeding the questions to me both at once. So that's called double coverage. All right. Um, then let's look at the last couple of things we need to talk about. Let's go to the dashboard. And here on the dashboard, you can find some really important and useful things. And I'm hoping this isn't one of those underutilized areas of AccuGraph that I was talking about at the beginning. Okay, the cool thing about the dashboard is you're one click away from just about any resource you could possibly need as an AccuGraph user. So for example, <clears throat> excuse me, if I need video training, I want video training on you know, any particular feature in AccuGraph. I click on the AccuGraph video training. I'll just bring this over here. It popped on my other screen. And it opens this window on the web. And here I am in the video training. And so I've got the Getting Started series. I've got the Practice Management series and so on. If I click here on Getting Started 101, I've got videos about how to get started with AccuGraph. And then I can go back and practice management videos. Notes and Templates 101, by the way. If you click on Download Resources, that's where we have some downloadable templates for AccuGraph that you can use. 
So that question was asked earlier. There's a whole webinar here. You can watch the webinar, you can download the resources. All right, going back to our dashboard, along with the AccuGraph video training, you'll notice there's webinars. And so we've got a whole stable full of really good content we've created over the last couple of years of these webinars. And so if you wanna go back and review them, maybe you have a half hour at lunch or something, click on webinars and you can go back and there's an awful lot here for you. I know I'm scrolling really fast and probably looks like a blur on your screen, but this is a great resource. Go back, check it out. Case studies is gonna take you over to the blog where you can look at the case studies archives. So all the case studies that we've posted about all kinds of various questions and problems, there's pages and pages of them here. So you can go check that out and so on. Marketing training, the all access training pass. What about the Facebook user group. For our AccuGraph 5 users, this is a great resource, the AccuGraph 5 user group, where you can interact with other users, <laughs> you can get Kimberly's awesome posts, you can find out what other people are doing, people ask questions, people post graphs here, uh, and get input from other practitioners, really a useful place to go. And it's just one click away even if you're not all that familiar with Facebook. So my point is, use your dashboard not only for training and for community, even if you need to manage your account to see what current plan you're on, when it's going to renew, which devices you have. If you have more than one computer that's connected to AccuGraph, you can click, it'll pop a window. Oh, it popped it on my other screen. You won't be able to see it here. But it'll show you what computers you currently have active on your AccuGraph account, and you can add and remove computers. Everything's just a click away. So if you haven't started using the dashboard in AccuGraph 5, start using it. You'll find that stuff is a lot easier, and it's your one-stop shop for anything and everything AccuGraph related. Okay, cool. Look at that. I got through all the new features that I wanted to talk about. Um, and now I've got a couple minutes left, I can take some questions. So if you've got questions about anything we've talked about or anything else AccuGraph related, go ahead and fire them off right now. I'm gonna take a look and see what people are asking. Um, <laughs> Aaron says, hey, thanks Adrian for showing easy access to webinars. My pleasure. Uh, please go look at them, use them. I hope they're helpful. Um, I'll tell you something, well, there's a, there's a little delay here, and so while I'm waiting for questions, I wanna tell you, webinar day, which happens around here about once a month, is like, I don't know, it, it, it's the, the pinnacle of the month. Everything kind of points to webinar day. We prepare for a couple of weeks. We've been working all morning setting up the technical stuff. Uh, after this, then we're all, gonna, we're all gonna go eat lunch together. It's kind of a party around here when we do webinars. And we do it because we want to continually be providing value, great content for our users. It's our way of interacting, of being part of the community and showing appreciation because it's all of you who keep us in business. We want to give back. And so we really do put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into these webinars. And I hope you find them as, uh, as useful as we hope they are. All right. Um, any other questions? I don't see much else coming in right now. So hopefully we got things covered well. I hope today was useful for everyone. Remember, if you have questions, jump over to the Facebook users group for AccuGraph users. And uh, we're always here for you. Give us a call if we can help. And we are ready to sign off. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.